Where is that darn galaxy? I know it's around here somewhere. Ah, shoot. Hello and welcome to the program Sula's Big Adventures with me, Sula. In this episode, I'm going to explain how to find objects in the night sky with your telescope. If you look at an astronomy book, it'll probably say to star hop. But what is star hopping and how do you do it? When I was first starting out, my guide to the universe was Night Watch by Terence Dickinson. He doesn't even mention the word star hop. He has one small section in this book called Telescope Experience, and it says, being able to locate objects in the sky is primarily an exercise in self-edification. I would agree with that, and that's what star hopping is. It's learning the night sky. He goes on to say that most amateur astronomers will learn 500 to 1,000 stars location to help them to find objects or star hop. If you're just starting out, my best recommendation to you would be to start out with a pair of binoculars, even before you buy a telescope, and go out at night and start learning the constellations and learn the brightest stars and spend some time outside and notice how the constellations move across the sky as time goes by from east to west. And also, you'll notice right away that the constellations are huge. These star charts can't possibly convey how big the constellations are. So it's going to take time, but go out with binoculars before trying to start locating things with the telescope, and it will help you a lot. For one thing, a pair of binoculars usually has a six-degree field of view much bigger than your telescope, which, depending on your eyepiece, might be a one degree or even less than one degree. And also, you get to look with both eyes, so it's very comfortable. And it doesn't change the orientation of what you're looking at. Whatever you see with your naked eye, that's how it will look in the binoculars. And that's not always true of finder scopes on a telescope. So go out with binoculars and learn the night sky, at least the brightest stars and the constellations. It's going to take time, but over time, you'll begin to learn more and more. And once you're comfortable, then go to the telescope and try to star hop. Another thing that will help you is to learn distances. Your hand is a handy guide to distances. Your pinky is one degree, three fingers is five degrees, your fist is 10 degrees, your index and pinky finger are 15 degrees, and your thumb and pinky are 25 degrees. So if I say, Antares is one degree from M4, you know that if you hold your arm completely outstretched, your pinky is one degree. And that's how far those two objects will be. And they would both fit in a six degree field of view in a pair of binoculars. And M4 is a good thing to practice on finding with your binoculars once you start learning the sky a little bit. Another thing you want to do is to learn the brightness of stars. Stars are classified by their magnitude, and the higher the number, the dimmer they are. Most people can see up to about a 6.5 magnitude star. Anything dimmer than that, you won't be able to see even in a dark sky site, unless it's an extremely dark sky site, you might be able to see a magnitude 7 star. Those are very dim stars. The brightest star in the night sky is Sirius, and it's negative 1.3 or negative 1.4. So a negative number is very bright. Venus is negative 4. It's the brightest object in the nighttime sky after the moon. And so when you look up and you see the stars, you need to get used to determining their brightness. That will be very helpful later in star hopping. Once you've learned the constellations and the brightest stars, at least, now you're ready to go to your telescope and star hop to locate objects. 
But before you start, take your telescope out during the day and make sure your finder scope is lined up with your telescope. Point it to a distant object. I like to point mine at that cabin. It's, I guess it's about a mile or more away. This telescope has a red dot finder, so it doesn't magnify, it doesn't project. The red dot is just reflected back to my eyeball. And I get the cabin in the red dot, and then I look in the telescope and it helps to use a reticle eyepiece that has crosshairs so you can get the object in the center of the crosshairs so not just his cabin but something small like the peak of the roof is what I like to do and once I have it at the peak of the roof and the eyepiece then I want to make adjustments to the red dot binder until it's in the red dot this one you have to use a hex wrench most red dot finders have dials on them, and if you have a finder scope, you would make adjustments to these screws until it's in the center of the finder scope and in the center of the crosshairs of the reticule, and that's essential. And once you have those lined up, then you're ready for some stargazing. And the next step is to know the orientation of your telescope, and you'll notice right away when you're lining up your finder scope that this refractor has a mirror image view. So the man's roof is on top where it should be, but he has a very bright light on the side of his house. And when I look through binoculars, or if I could see that far with the naked eye, it's on the right hand side of his house, but in this telescope, it's on the left hand side. So it's a mirror image. All refractors that use diagonals and catadioptric telescopes that use diagonals show you a mirror image. It doesn't really matter when you're looking at something in the sky, except the moon, um, but it's good to know the orientation of your telescope because it might not be the same as the orientation of your finder scope, and you need to know that because that's also true of some finder scopes. This telescope is a schmidt cassegrain telescope. It's a type of catadioptric telescope. So when I look at that man's cabin through the eyepiece, the roof is on top where it should be, but the light that he has on the side of the house is on the opposite side from what you would see with your naked eye or a pair of binoculars because it's a mirror image in a refractor or catadioptric telescope. I have two finders on this telescope. I have a Telrad. It doesn't have any kind of uh, orientation because it doesn't project. It just is a glass with a red target on it, a bullseye, and that helps you to center the object you're looking for. It doesn't project anything into the sky, so nothing's inverted or mirror or anything. This other finder scope is what you call a straight through finder scope. And the view through this finder scope is inverted. So the object is upside down. So what I see in this straight through finder scope will not be what I see in the eyepiece. So when you're trying to star hop, you need to know that orientation because if I'm down to the nitty gritty and I'm to that star and the next thing is the deep sky object, it might be on the opposite side from what it is in the telescope. So that's why you need to know the orientation of your finder scope and your telescope. This is my beloved Dobsonian. Dobsonians are Newtonian reflectors. And all Newtonian reflectors, including Dobsonians, will show you an inverted view. So when I look at that man's cabin through the eyepiece of my Dobsonian, his roof is on the bottom, it's upside down. And that's true of Newtonian reflectors and straight through finder scopes. They will show you an inverted view. I have two finder scopes on this telescope. I have a red dot finder that, as I said, it's just a red dot. It doesn't project, it doesn't magnify. And I find them very useful in locating objects and star hopping. But to locate very dim objects, I have a second finder scope on here. And Unlike most uh, finder scopes with a diagonal, mine has an erecting prism on it. That means this particular finder scope is right side up. 
It's not inverted, it's not mirror image. It's exactly what I would see with my eye or with the pair of binoculars. But most um, finder scopes with a diagonal on it are just little miniature refractors. And so they will show you a mirror image just like a refractor does. Uh, so it's good to know the orientation of your finder scope and your telescope when you're trying to star hop. You know the orientation of your telescope, you know distances, and you know the orientation of your finder scope, and you've got a high quality finder scope because you're going to need it. Now you need a reference. You can use uh, digital references like Stellarium. They're on your phone. I, I, I love Stellarium, but I personally never use it. I always use <laughs> Sky and Telescope's Pocket Sky Atlas. Every amateur astronomer should own a Sky and Telescope Pocket Atlas. This is the Jumbo Edition, which I prefer. I have the smaller one, but I find these big charts easier to read. I like this format better. So I highly recommend that you get a copy of Pocket Sky Atlas by Sky and Telescope. Or you can use Stellarium or Sky Safari or other digital ones, but I, I just don't. I just like the paper. Maybe I'm old fashioned, but I, I think it's really helpful to see a bigger area than you can see on your phone. But you also may want to get something to help you with your star hop. And I used to recommend this book, Turn Left at Orion, and it's a good book, but I find the format confusing a little bit because he starts out with a big area of the sky. And then all of a sudden, when he goes to the finder scope, he's showing an inverted view. And it can be confusing to a beginner. It's a good book. It'll tell you some targets, and he gives some very specific instructions. But some of them are a little weird. He was saying to start at Arcturus to find M10 in Ophiuchus. I, I would never start at Arcturus. I think that's weird. I would start at Antares, but that's just me. So this is a good book, and maybe the fact that the little pictures are in inverted view doesn't confuse you, and if so, I would recommend it. It's by Guy Consolmagno. An excellent, excellent book is Deep Sky Wonders by Sue French. This is a great book. Her enthusiasm is palpable, and she goes through each month of the year and tells you things to look for, and it has star hopping advice on it. The great thing about star hopping is that in, unlike a computerized telescope where you're just looking at one thing, when you have a Dobsonian or other manual telescope, you can see all the little other things around the main object that you otherwise wouldn't look at with a computerized telescope. And you can just wander. So this is a great book, Deep Sky Wonders, Turn Left at Orion. Or if you just want to explore on your own, get the Pocket Sky Atlas. It's invaluable. It looks like it's going to rain. I was going to show an example of some star hopping. Maybe I can. I'll show you something easy just to explain how to star hop. But the truth is, it just takes experience. You got to get out there and you got to practice and it will be frustrating at first. You'll feel like you can't find anything. But another very important thing that will help you in star hopping is to know what you're looking for. That's why I like to provide sketches of what I see through the eyepiece. So what do I mean when I say star hopping? Well, it just means that you start with something very bright and familiar and easy to find. Arcturus or Vega, something like that, for example. And from there you go to another star that's not as bright, but closer to the object, and you keep going until you get the object in your telescope. For example, let's say that we wanted to look at M101, the pinwheel galaxy in Ursa Major. So I'm on page 53 of the Pocket Sky Atlas, and I can see that the orientation is not how the Big Dipper looks in the sky. In the sky, Alcade and Mizar are 
on the same plane, but in this book, Alcate is below my czar. So I have to turn my star chart to make the orientation the same as it looks in the sky. And I can see that Mazar and Alke, the last two stars in the handle of the Big Dipper, make a triangle with M101. So that will help. And I can also see that there's a string of three magnitude six stars that I can probably follow in a line from Mazar to this star that's not labeled on this chart, but that is very close to M101. So I would start at Mizar, get that string of three in the finder scope, and then go from there to M101, and that's how you star hop. I would show you in the sky, but not only is the moon out, but it's cloudy. It also helps a lot if you know what to look for. So before you go out, you can look on the internet and see what's the magnitude of the object, and the size of it, parent size, and that will help a lot. And one good thing about this turn left at Orion is that he gives uh, simulations of what things look like in a four inch refractor and in an eight inch Dobsonian. They're simulations, so they're not perfect, but they're helpful to know whether you're just looking for a speck or a smudge or something larger. And that's very helpful. And you can look for pictures on the internet, but don't look at astro photographs because those are long exposures of things you can't see with your human eye. But a sketch <laughs> is helpful. The next step to locating objects in your telescope is to identify an object or a few that you would like to view that evening that are visible at that time of year and night. And then chart your route to the object by using someone's instructions, for example, the ones in the book, Turn Left at Orion, or there are many websites that will explain ways to find objects and you can use that person's suggestions, or you can chart your own path. Whatever works for you is the one you should use. But the key is to be able to identify patterns in the sky and match those to your sky chart, whether you're using a printed one like the Sky Atlas or a digital one like Stellarium or Sky Safari or Starry Night. And to identify not only the big asterisms like the Big Dipper or the backward question mark in Leo, but little asterisms like a string of three stars or a triangle or a triangle made by two bright objects and the object you want to see. And once you're able to identify those things in the sky, then you'll be able to much more easily locate an object with your telescope. Some things are going to be near a bright object. For example, M4 is right next to Antares, the brightest star in Scorpius. And that might be a good thing to start with to give you an idea of the scale of things and the distances. And other things might be near a well-recognized asterism like the Big Dipper. For example, M97 is in the Big Dipper. Also M57, the Ring Nebula, is in the bottom two stars of the parallelogram below Vega. And recognizing that parallelogram is the kind of pattern that I mean that you need to be able to recognize in the sky to help you to locate objects. Other things are not going to be near anything bright. For example, Bode's galaxies, uh, M81 and M82, they're in the Big Dipper, and most people recognize the Big Dipper. But once you start with the two stars that you start with to locate it, you start with Fecta and Doobie, and you, the distance from Fecta to Doobie is 10 degrees, and you go another 10 degrees in that same line to get to M81 and M82. You just go that 10 degrees to get to it. And your Telrad would help with that one because the Telrad has concentric circles and the outer red circle is four degrees. So from Doobie to M81 and M82 is two and a half Telrads. So things like that are what will help you to locate objects in the night sky. When I'm looking for NGC 6826, I notice that there's a string of three stars near it. Maybe you can't see the stars, 
because every buddy's sky is going to be different and the conditions will be different. But for me, I can see it. And that's what I use to get in the finder scope because it's near the object I want to see, 6826. So that's what I mean when I say learn to identify patterns in the sky that will get you to where you want to go. Now I'm going to show you some examples in the sky and how I locate an object. And if it works for you, try it out. If it doesn't, maybe you can't see some of the dimmer stars or um, you see some other pattern that works for you, use that, use whatever works. But learning patterns in the sky and learning the sky and learning the asterisms and the constellations and the stars, that's how you locate objects in your telescope. I have a pro tip. If you get that magic object in your finder scope, the string of three stars, the triangle of stars, the magnitude six star, or whatever it is that's going to get you to the object you want to view, and then you put your eye on your eyepiece and it's not there, so you start swimming around like this, lost in space. We've all done it. <laughs> it's time to start over because probably your magic object is not in your finder scope like you thought, so it's best to just start over. To find NGC 6826, I find Cygnus the Swan, also known as the Northern Cross, and I locate its brightest star, Deneb. And from Deneb, I head northwest to an obvious double star, Omicron Cygni, and I keep going northwest to a string of three stars, Iota Cygni, an unnamed star, and 16 Cygni. And I put 16 Cygni in the finder scope because it's right next to NGC 6826. And then it should be in my eyepiece. And this is how it looked to me in the actual sky. Again, I find Cygnus the Swan and go to Deneb, its brightest star, and then head northwest to Omicron Cygni the double star, and keep going northwest until I see the string of three stars, Iota Cygni, the unnamed star, and 16 Cygni. And I put 16 Cygni in the finder scope, and 6826 should be in the eyepiece. I hope you found this presentation helpful to help you find objects in your telescope. It gets easier with experience and time. And practice. That's it for now. I'll see you soon. Until then, get outside and enjoy the night sky. Dark skies forever. Sula, signing off.